Now I have a great pleasure of introducing an architect that we admire very much and unfortunately is not as well known in the United States as he should be. So when we had the opportunity to invite him as a keynote, he was our top draft pick. And in terms of sharing, I'm gonna read his biography, but I just wanna say something about him personally. We're talking about asset base and a lot of reasons this coalition works is people give to the others and in kind. And one thing Peter did for all of us was invite us over to see his work in Austria and also to have a amazing experience of staying in a project that his students had built, converting a beautiful monastery to a facility that uh, workers with special needs could provide bed and breakfast. And it was so sensitively done so that the the stakeholder nature between those serving and those being served was intermingled for the benefit of both. And so um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Peter Fettinger today. Um, he will present hands-on social activism in architectural education, design build studio at Vienna University of Technology. Uh, Peter will present a selection of his different design build projects giving insight into the diverse processes of the projects and discussing their relevance in architectural education. Founded by Peter in 2000 at the University's Institute of Architecture and Design, the Design Build Studio has been realizing a big variety of different projects ranging from temporary installations and in urban public spaces to permanent buildings for socially engaged organizations located in Austria, South Africa, and Indonesia. The immediate goal of the Design Build Studio is not only to create architecture, but rather to give students the possibility to evaluate the quality of their thinking against the constraints of the real world and to understand the implications of their decisions in a broader context. Furthermore, the studio focuses its efforts at socially engaged building projects and encourages students to get active and take on civic responsibility. Welcome, Peter. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Lisa and Brian, for the invitation to come here to, to Denver and to speak at this Great Structures for Inclusion conference. I'm really very happy to be here. Um, I'm doing this uh, design build studio for some 20 years uh, already. In this lecture today, I would like to show you through a, a selection of uh, about eight uh, projects, which I realized together with uh, my students uh, in about two decades now already. Uh, but before, just a few general words on our design build studio. So within our studio, the students are running through all stages of a small but real building project. <clears throat> They're working in collective teamwork from the first sketch till fixing the last screw with all related responsibilities and consequences. And within these projects, uh, we also try to expand the traditional role of the architect as a service provider acting in the most cases, not only as designers, but also as initiators, fundraisers, constructors, and in some cases, even as operators and users, as program curators, general organizers, and caretakers of these projects in one entity. So the students learn to deal with uh, small budgets, tight deadlines, and unexpected problems. And most importantly, uh, <clears throat> they are confronted with the uh, setbacks, which you usually uh, have to deal with when you are transforming plans into the built reality. But not only the collaboration within the student team, but also with the clients, users, local authorities, consultants, professionals, material suppliers and sponsors makes an important part of the learning and doing process of these projects. So Brian already uh, talked about this uh, description of, of the goal of the Design Build Studio. And it's really important that it's not just about architecture, but rather that the students uh, get the possibility to evaluate the, the quality of the thinking against the constraints of the real world. Uh, I just want to give you a brief idea about how the Design Build Studio is embedded in our university. So the School of Architecture at the Vienna University of Technology, it's quite different from American schools uh, of architecture. So not only in, in size, but also in the facilities, which are not really sufficient uh, for such a huge uh, quantity of, of students. 
So at the moment, there are around 3,600 students enrolled in architecture at our school. 1,400 of them are in the master studies. And every year they can choose uh, out of a variety of around 80 design studios. And uh, the studios are coping with uh, very different topics. And just one out of these 80 design studios is the design build studio. So unfortunately, our university can't really provide any additional resources for this design build studio. So neither money nor infrastructure. So we are depending quite a lot on, on partners from outside university. So there are companies who are sponsoring and funding our projects, either by donating building materials or what's much better by donating money. So some projects are also funded by departments of the city of Vienna. For example, the Department of Youth and Education or the Department of Art and Culture. And there are also many different NGOs involved like Education Africa, Sarge and Caritas Austria, which uh, we do many pro projects with. So there are basically uh, two ranges of projects we're doing within the Design Build Studio. So on the one hand, temporary installations for urban public space in European cities. And on the other hand, uh, permanent buildings for social institutions in South Africa, Indonesia, and in the meantime, also quite a lot in and around Austria and Vienna. <clears throat> so the very first projects of our design build studio were focusing quite a lot on temporary interventions in public urban space. They were about urban appropriation, about activating public space, about improving the relationship between social and spatial matters. So with the project add-on, we wanted to add a usable vertical extension to public space, a collage of different functions of everyday life stacked above each other. A public space as stage and grandstand for real encounters. And we also wanted to use this possibility to discuss public space versus private space. So we realized add on at the Wallensteinplatz, an urban square in the 20th district of Vienna. And we were funded uh, in large part by the Fund for Public Art of the city of Vienna. So for six weeks, add on was hosting a dense program of daily workshops, lectures, performances, and concerts. Artists and residents were invited to live and work on site in an additional structure, the lower part, which you can see here on the, on the right, which was connected to the tower with a bridge. So the whole tower was completely public and accessible. Anybody could step up and use it. And uh, so walking up the stairs, you could find quite different scenarios like stacked landscapes. So from the info kiosk at the level of the square, then elevated table soccer, a music room covered with hundreds of hand cut mirrors, some overhanging workspaces equipped with internet access. But yeah, things like these, uh, they just work in summer and we had really a, a great summer in, in, in 2005. And uh, yeah, while some passersby just watched it on from a safe distance, Others used the potential of this temporary intervention quite intensively. And uh, yeah, of course it was the kids who had first realized uh, the possibilities uh, offered by add-on and convinced the parents to make use of the structure. But basically all generations were interested and curious and excited and they enjoyed to explore the extraordinary environment to discover unexpected settings and to interact with the installation and with the other visitors. So here, for example, you can see an installation by artist in residence, uh, David Moises. He installed um, a car wash to, as he said, polish a skin on the way to the whirlpool. And so this car wash was operating on and off by random. And this caused quite some surprise for the visitors. Yeah, some further steps up, we installed a caravan for the housekeeper where always two members of our student team were staying during the nights to take care of add-on. And especially a project like add-on, they only work with the uh, intense care of a big team, which always has to be on site to take care of it, 
to maintain it, to clean it, and what is most important, to communicate with the visitors. So it's definitely not a drop sculpture, which you can just leave uh, by itself. So also the canteen on a level of nine meters was an important communication trigger and somehow the, the vibrant heart of it on. So every day, different teams of students, artists and architects were invited to run the kitchen. But many people also came uh, with their own picnic baskets and uh, uh, sometimes already early in the morning to enjoy a breakfast with a view. So from the roof terrace, you had a view down to the artists and residence units. So they provided sleeping and, and sanitary uh, units for the artists, as well as a kind of common workshop space underneath. And these invited artists they were undertaking interventions specially related to the installation, to the square, and to the neighborhood. So for six weeks, add-on positioned itself at the interface between publicness and privateness. It offered insight as well as outlook. It allowed new perspectives on the familiar surrounding and questioned burned in modes of perception of public space. So temporary interventions have the great advantage that more experimentation is possible than in the, in the core set of, of permanence. And the limited time frame allows not only more daring construction, but also a more intense and concentrated activity in and around the installation. So while its physical presence may have uh, disappeared at the end of the project, memories and the emotionality of the place still remain. So a completely different set of framework uh, conditions. Um, came up with the Orange Farm Township project. Uh, which we started in 2003 in the township, 50 kilometers south of Johannesburg. So in comparison to the previous FMR projects, here the goal was to design and build permanent buildings for social institutions. So proper structures which can withstand intense use and any weather condition over many years. So the initiative to the first project in South Africa was initiated by the Austrian politician and green activist uh, Christoph Gorher, he was already familiar with our previous projects and asked us if we would like to try to design and build a project in South Africa. So Christoph already had a good contacts to the township as he already supported the foundation of a primary school, the Masambane College, which you can see here, uh, a few years before. And uh, so this college became an important starting point for our design build projects in South Africa. So in uh, summer 2003, we undertook uh, the first research trip to the township to intensify the existing contacts, to meet uh, potential project partners, to identify possible building tasks, and to check out the framework conditions on site. So this way, we also came in contact with uh, Tandi Miyako and her organization, Modimo Omoholo, in the neighborhood. And she brought together disabled people in quite informal structures and tried to keep them busy with the manufacture of simple handcrafts during day. And so her organization, uh, before she worked from her home, and then finally they, they got uh, donated a site in the township by the city of Johannesburg, but with the obligation to set up a permanent structure there within 18 months. So we decided to go for the realization of a daycare center for these handicapped as our first project. So in the winter term, the students undertook uh, the research and design process in Vienna. So drawings and photographs of models were communicated via email to the director of the college, who then obtained feedback uh, from the local stakeholders. And in the spring break, uh, we traveled to Orange Farm with uh, 25 students and the construction site, which was yeah, far away from the environment, the students, we were used to, uh, so not only in geographical, but also in social terms. And this became the place of work and learning for six intense weeks. Uh, the student team was supported by five local craftsmen, as well as members of the organization Modimo Moholo, 
who as far as the handicap allowed, actively took part in the building process. So simple, inexpensive and locally available building material like pine wood, concrete bricks and corrugated metal uh, sheets were used. And yeah, in total, the, the daycare center had a floor area of around 2,500 square feet. And um, yeah, for the following year, we were asked to extend this daycare center with a home for homeless handicapped and uh, some more workshop facilities. And so here you see Michelle, a student who was already involved in the first project already. And she offered to take over the design for the extension as her thesis project. And on the right, that's, that's Tandy, the woman who, who runs the place. So the idea of a large roof uh, spanning over indoor and outdoor facilities was further developed and under a load bearing roof construction made of pine wood, we set up the rooms with uh, dry stack adobe bricks. Yeah, and as these uh, two pilot projects uh, proved uh, that the idea of realizing projects with architecture students in South African townships worked quite well, the initiator, Christoph Gorher, he decided to, to found an NGO called Sarge in order to implement more of these projects by approaching also further schools of architecture in Austria and Germany. Uh, the focus of the first series of upcoming projects of this uh, newly established NGO was on educational facilities and in particular on kindergartens. So here you see the kindergarten Emanuel daycare, which we were asked to replace with a new building. And here's some impressions of the opening ceremony. And the climbing slide, which you can see here, turned out to, to be the biggest attraction in this very flat uh, township and also the, the gallery level, uh, which uh, revealed a, a wide view over the township uh, was immediately under heavy use. So in the same year, this was in 2006, also further schools of architecture were approached by Christoph Koyer's NGO to design and build kindergartens in and around the township orange farm. So for example, Theo Munich and Theo Graz, and here another kindergarten by RWTH Aachen. And yeah, for most of these schools, uh, this should be their first experience with uh, design build. And for many of the involved professors, it was the start of a long-term occupation with and passion for the topic design build. So a lively exchange between the involved universities began and even some of the students who were part of our pilot project, they then were hired as external staff by these universities. Uh, so there was really a, a big focus on this knowledge transfer between the involved universities. Another kindergarten by Kunst ohne Linz. By the way, also Anna Heringer, uh, who was a student at uh, Kunst ohne Linz, uh, got kind of infected with design build through this particular project. And here, one more kindergarten by Uni Innsbruck, quite a fancy one. And yeah, after this series of uh, kindergartens, which were quite decentralized and scattered over various townships, Koher bundled uh, the energy in an entire campus school, uh, which he realized in Johannesburg and later on also another campus school at the South African Wild Coast. So in total uh, over the years around 16 different universities were actively designing and building individual classrooms and infrastructures while we just were involved in the, in the pilot phase. In the very beginning uh, some university studios continued their commitment even on a, on a yearly base. Yeah, and in uh, 2019, so 15 years after the, the pilot project, I had the chance to travel to South Africa again and was very happy to, to revisit our projects. So the kindergarten, which we left in 2006 like this, in the meantime, got a, a new and very ambitious color scheme done by Lynn Diva, the lady who runs the place. And uh, the, 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 the building is... Uh, used during daytime as kindergarten, but also as a community center for the neighbors in the evenings and on the, on the weekends. And uh, yeah, as the kindergarten uh, was in great demand in the last years, so Lindive also earned some money with it and was able then to, to build an additional group room 
on the side with the money she earned running the kindergarten. So it was really great to see that she could manage to run and even improve uh, and extend her kindergarten completely self-contained. And I also visited the daycare center for the disabled. Also this location was still very busy and constantly got uh, extended by Tandemi Yako. You can see her here on the right. And yeah, it is good to see that everything is uh, still in good shape and uh, that you really take, take care of the building. And that's the most crucial point of projects like these to select uh, the right local partners you build for and with. And uh, yeah, even if projects are well intentioned and well executed, they can completely fail uh, when the local partner is overstrained to the project or just can't manage to run it. Uh, yeah, in 2007, we were invited by the Austrian branch of the international NGO Caritas to extend an existing orphanage uh, on the Indonesian island Nias uh, with a multi-purpose hall. So Nias was severely hit by the tsunami and following earthquakes two years before. And uh, so this new hall should not only be used as playroom and gathering space for the 80 orphans, but also as community center for the whole village. So design again was undertaken in collaborative and collective process by the students during winter term. And as a team of 20, we finally traveled to Indonesia for the realization in the spring break and stayed there for eight weeks. So for the basic construction, we could use local wood, which was harvested from the forest of the monastery, uh, which was running the orphanage and yeah, it was, incredibly strong and heavy wood, which allowed us then finally to reduce the dimensions of the structure to half of what we pre-calculated with the students and the structural engineers uh, back in Vienna. And so um, we could still change this on the building site and generally only quite a small range of materials was available in, in stock on this very small island. So corrugated metal, translucent, uh, PVC, plywood and cement. To react to the climatic challenges, we constructed the roof and the exterior walls two layered. And so extensive roofs uh, protected the uh, entrances from rain and sun. And uh, the building also followed uh, the natural drop of the terrain of four meters, but also had a positive effect on the air convection within the building. A relevant aspect of uh, doing design build projects in threshold countries is to sensibilize the students for global relations and also to confront them with a very different reality of life in these regions of the world. Another positive effect of doing a project quite far away from home is that the team is free from obligations and distractions which they would have in their normal everyday life back at home. So from sunrise to sunset we could could really dedicate our full time to the project six days a week and eight weeks in total. And that's really incredible how much energy can be generated when a team of 20 students is, is heading for a common aim with full enthusiasm. And then with the opening ceremony and the handover of the building to the users, a new phase of the project begins. So now the students can experience how their design proofs when it is used, uh, here the view of the central grandstand with the seating steps and platforms in use and it follows this natural topography of the site and connects the entrance and library area on the higher level with the assembly hall and music room on the lower. You can see a small hideout underneath the roof which is reserved just for kids. Yeah, after four projects uh, abroad, we put uh, our focus back to Vienna again from 2008 on. And the NGO Caritas, uh, which was in charge of the nearest project, they really proved to be a very professional and reliable partner. Um, and uh, so they also had many interesting and, and quite challenging building tasks back in Austria as well. And so in 2011, we were invited uh, for them to create a home base and competence center 
where the team of young Caritas uh, can provide knowledge, support, and infrastructure to socially engaged young people. So they wanted to create a place for workshops, meetings, benefit events, and lectures where young volunteers can meet to organize uh, social projects. But as first task of the project, the site to house this institution still had to be found. So we were also involved in this process of looking for a good place to, to start the initiative like this. And when we finally found this uh, vacant railway arch designed by Otto Wagner at the end of the 19th century, it was quite clear for us that's the place uh, uh, to, to build this structure. And so the, the arch was completely naked, more than 10 meters high, and uh, the floor was just rammed earth. And yeah, so for the design phase, which took three months, uh, we already used this vacant arch as our planning office. Uh, and to enable a collective design process, it's always important to have one common room where all the students can work together. So we don't have anything like this in Vienna that we can work with a group of students in one room for the entire term. Uh, it's just not possible because we don't have the capacity for that. But so we always have to look for a place to, to create this kind of common, common working place. Um, and especially here, it was a great opportunity to de develop the design right on, on the future building side. So, you already get a feeling for, for this space. So in the beginning, uh, small teams uh, developed different scenarios, strategies, and approaches. And then in weekly sessions, these ideas uh, were discussed in the big team. And together we decided which ideas to follow on and uh, which to let fall. So here's see a midtime review where representatives of the Caritas, of the building department of the city of Vienna, of the district, and also of the railway company, um, accompanied with structural engineers, they all came to our temporary planning office to discuss the project. And yeah, finally, for, the, for this arch, uh, which at the highest point was 10 meters high, the 21 students uh, developed a freestanding multi-story functional furniture which like a spiral was connecting many different functions on various platforms. So soon the planning office turned to a building site and the pencils were replaced by shovels. And except for two steel beams, uh, the entire construction was made of wood, which was hand cut and mounted on site. And yeah, of course, uh, a structural engineer was supervising uh, these overhanging constructions, uh, which the students completely fabricated on site with their own hands. So here you see the students doing the final surfaces and that's the final product one and a half years uh, after the students did the first sketch. So from the big event space on the ground floor, you can reach a platform dedicated to manual work some steps further, you can reach a meeting place and library. Then further passing another small auditorium, you can reach an area dedicated to researching, discussing and working. Yeah, for nine years now, Young Caritas uh, is operating this uh, action fabric as they call it. And um, so many socially engaged uh, young people uh, had the possibility to use this infrastructure to organize uh, social projects there. Um, in 2012, the Dean of our faculty asked us to develop a mobile laboratory for the Future Lab. That's an interdisciplinary platform at our faculty. And uh, so the students had the task to create a modular structure that should work as mobile classroom and workshop as lecture hall and exhibition center. And of course it should also equipped with a bar and kitchen to become a welcoming place and to work for openings and parties as well. So 30 students were involved in this project. Uh, the design process, like always, was a collaborative one. And after four months, uh, this design was finalized. It was based on used shipping containers, which should be adapted and modified. And between the containers, a wooden structure should create a spacious hall 
sitting stairs should not only work as an auditorium, but also make the workspaces and terraces on the first floor accessible. So we decided to do the complete fabrication process and first setup of the structure in the park right in front of our university, which you can see here in the back. And after first probation time of one month in front of university, the mobile structure then should always for one entire year move to various areas of urban development within the city of Vienna. In reality, it uh, came quite different, uh, but I will explain that later. So here you see the student teams uh, drawing the footprint of the lab, while another team of students was on a shopping tour in Vienna's harbor. So the containers were delivered completely raw and untreated and then cut apart by the students. And yeah, an essential aspect of design projects is that the design and building activities are executed by the same acting persons and that there's no longer as usual in the established architecture practice, a strict division of those who design and those who build. So you have the possibility to develop the design hand in hand with the building process. And building by one's own hand uh, enables a potential of ideas and experience, which then in return can inform and generate the design. So we call this process uh, design through making. So all these containers were modified on the ground floor and then lifted into the right position by a crane. And uh, yeah, we also wanted to keep the, this original container surface uh, visible. So everybody should see that these containers already made thousands of miles, that they have a story to tell and uh, that they also got some scarves on the long journey. Yeah, the location in front of university, which was just supposed to be the, the starting point of a traveling project, it unfolded to be a perfect site for a structure like this. So the possibilities offered by the mobile urban lab as a public infrastructure on this very central park in the middle of Vienna, they were utilized not only to be the, by the university, but also by various neighboring institutions which asked if they could use the structure for doing presentations, meetings, workshops in public space. So the fact that we installed this temporary structure in this park, this triggered a demand for a space like this. So we finally prolonged our temporary permission again and again, and uh, finally ended up staying there in front of university for two and a half years. And yeah, while the upper floor was used as student workspace, we used the hall for public lectures, workshops, film screenings, panel discussions, exhibitions, concerts, and parties. And in 2015, the Mobile Urban Lab finally had the opportunity to live up to its name. So from the urban and very frequented site in front of our university, the journey took us uh, to the concrete desert of the urban development area, New Marks. Uh, so here the urban development agency of the city of Vienna uh, offered us a giant site of uh, the former cattle market for temporary use, while this site was undergoing a rezoning and long-term planning process. So it was 40,000 square meters in a quiet central area of Vienna, and it was definitely an interesting occasion for us. And at the same time, the refugee crisis reached its uh, peak. So more than 600 refugees from Syria were housed in a former office complex, just a few meters away, right on the top. And so these uh, circumstances, they, they really prompted us to initiate a new project uh, called Open Marks. So we wanted to use the site to create a temporary place which should encourage um, exchange between various groups of people. So on the one hand side, the long-term residents of the surrounding district, uh, St. Mark's, and on the other hand, uh, the new neighbors with more than 600 refugees from Syria living just around the corner. And as a third group, students, faculty, NGOs, and also private people actively engaging in refugee work. So the mobile urban lab uh, became our base camp and planning office for open marks. And in and around the mobile urban lab, we developed a spatial setting that 
uh, invited people with a very different background to exchange culture and knowledge and to simply spend time together, learning, discussing, playing, producing, preparing, planting, making music, cooking and eating together. So some more containers were purchased, adapted and extended by wooden construction. And a small group of refugees uh, was also working together with us on the building site. And yeah, well, unfortunately we, we couldn't pay them, but as the students didn't get paid either. So this collaboration was on, a, on an equal base in a way. But even more important than payment for the refugees was that they had something serious to do during the day. So Asim, for example, the guy on the right, uh, he was not only the best dressed man on our building site, he was running uh, his own carpenter workshop back in Syria, which he left uh, one year before. And uh, he had more knowledge on, on woodworks than all students together. And so soon he took over the role as foreman on the construction site. And he really enjoyed getting up every morning, doing something useful again. So every day on the building site, uh, one student and one refugee was were as a team responsible for preparing lunch. So this was sometimes also resulting in quite interesting fusion kitchen. And here some images of the open kitchen, which we realized there. It was one of the most heavily used parts of uh, Open Marks project. And the kitchen was extended uh, with a long table, which offered seats for up to 50 people. And here you can see the bicycle workshop. Uh, it was operated by a very ambitious uh, NGO. So people could donate their old or broken bikes and the bikes then got repaired by the refugees. And members of the NGO who were really real bike enthusiasts, so they assisted them uh, with their knowledge. And the repaired bikes then were handed over to the refugees and uh, that's very important. It made uh, independent mo mobility within the city possible for the, for the refugees. So this was quite an important issue. And also many refugees, especially women, they had little experience with uh, bicycles so far. So for them, our giant car-free site was also a good place to learn how to ride a bike. Here, the wooden metal uh, community workshop. It was run by NGO Caritas. So simple furniture was built here together with the refugees. And inside the mobile urban lab, uh, German classes for refugees were held by another NGO. So five years, Open Max was operating at this very special site. And this uh, giant guy drawn by artist Golif, he joined us for a while and kept a protecting eye on us. Nevertheless, we had to leave in summer 2020 and uh, make way for Vienna's new mega event hall, which will be built here on this site in the future. Uh, the next project, which is also featured in uh, Lisa's uh, great uh, Design for the Common Good exhibition, led us to a very idyllic place in the north of Austria, to the wine district around 80 kilometers north of Vienna. So here in the small village Unternalp, Caritas is running a home for mentally disabled people in a historically protected farm estate of a former monastery. Around 45 people with mental disabilities live and work here, and another additional 40 come here on a daily basis to work in different workshops. So one big focus of the workshops uh, the handicapped are busy with is organic agriculture. They're producing jams, honey, herbs, and also have plenty of hens, pigs, and sheep. But there are also other fields of workshops the handicapped uh, can choose to work in, like carpentering, painting, and masonry. And all this is embedded in a great landscape and historically protected architecture, partially dating back to the 16th century. So and when the right wing of this courtyard, which was the only building still used by the monastery in the last years, and this place also got available for use by Caritas, they decided to open a new workshop facility there, focusing on tourism. So the idea was to open a bed and breakfast facility, which should be run by people with disabilities. 
And apart from giving the clients a new field of training, a new facility opens uh, the farm to a multi-layered community of tourists and provides an inclusive experience. So they invited us to refurbish their facility according to, to these points. And uh, we started the project with a one week workshop on site to get a feeling for the location and for the people who should then run the place. So here, one of the handicapped people guides the students uh, through the so far untouched wing of the estate. And these uh, literally have been the first steps of a great 18 month collaboration with the handicapped people and their wonderful farm estates. So this more or less was the condition of the rooms as we found it, uh, not yet appropriate nor up to date to host guests. So right on site, the 20 students in teams of three to five people developed first ideas and concepts, how to organize the different functions of the future bed and breakfast. So many working weeks, discussions and presentations later, we ended up with uh, this design, which uh, suggested to have all the sleeping rooms in the second floor and due to the generous room height of more than five meters, we decided to introduce uh, freestanding sanitary units with a gallery floor above, which should work as additional sleeping and retreat space. A multifunctional community space for all guests uh, with seating stairs was also implanted in the second floor on, on the very left. And uh, the ground floor was supposed to house the reception, the back office, the breakfast room and the kitchen. Yeah, but first of all, our team had to get rid of tons of stuff uh, that was not original in this house. So not only walls, but uh, also the entire floor had to be removed. And we had to dig down uh, some meter of the soil. And with all these works, we had really great collaboration with the uh, handicapped people of the masonry workshop. So they joined us every day on the building site and really did a great job. And they enjoyed being an equivalent part of the team. Also for the students, it was a great experience to work hand in hand with uh, people with disabilities. So most of the students never before collaborated with uh, people with disabilities. And while in the beginning, uh, some were a bit reserved, soon uh, both sides came out of their shells. Here is side building that was in such a bad condition that we had to break it down. And yeah, we also had great support from professional workers uh, of the building company, which was officially supervising our works. So here on the left, you can uh, see Sepp, our foreman, giving instructions to the students. And so briefed by Sepp, uh, and always under his surveillance, uh, we could do a lot uh, on our own. Here one of the sanitary boxes gets built and kilometers of pipes and tubes were installed underneath the floor. Also for the electrical and HVAC installations, we were working hand in hand with uh, professional companies, which not only instructed us, uh, but which also were liable for any defects later on. Yeah, and at the same time, we were constantly working together with the uh, people with disabilities of the masonry workshops who here are cutting uh, the plaster boards for the sanitary units and this special constellation of people with uh, very different backgrounds and skills offered mutual learning and exchange, which usually is not evident on building sites. So of course, the fact of having these very different skilled teams uh, working together made quite some additional coordination work necessary. On the other hand, so more than 50 planning and construction meetings took place during the building process. So not only the interior is part of the project, but also the reconstruction of the courtyard building, where this new storage facility replaces the old site building, which we removed. And also the landscape design for the courtyard was an, an issue. So here you see the students doing the formwork for the barbecue and fireplace. And the students really enjoyed to work with concrete. And while the first concrete pieces which you see here still were done in quite rough form work. The students during the project decided to advance their form work skills and to start a kind of additional project within the project. So 
this gave them some room for material experimentation and decided to, to cast the work tops for the kitchen in high performance concrete. So here they are exactly measuring the mix of the concrete. And yeah, we set up a special working place for this site project. And yeah, generally labor intensive features like these would not be affordable in a conventional setting where a company is hired to realize the entire project uh, for a regular payment. So it's this special constellation of stakeholders in a project like this, which makes things uh, like the custom cast kitchen worktop possible on a win-win situation. So having extremely motivated students who work pro bono, but at the same time as a kind of reward, they have the possibility to design and realize an entire project already during their studies. So finally, the students also developed the branding and corporate identity for the bed and breakfast. So the name Oben Auf, meaning on top, uh, not only refers to the galleries above the sanitary boxes, but also refers to the geographical location in the wine hills north of Vienna. So the students created very different kinds of application for their corporate identity and even the wine bottles, a very important product of the region were branded with Oben Auf. Yeah, and finally, one and a half year after the students walked through the building for the first time, we were done. Then subsequently the handicapped for one month undertook a kind of test drive where also the students and the friends were invited to be test guests. And yeah, this was an important step for the handicapped uh, before they started the full operation of the bed and breakfast. And the test drive was also an ideal learning step for the students to slip into the role of the user in the end to see what works well and maybe what still could need some more adjustment. So here quickly some images of the final result. So here the kitchen worktop from hand cast concrete and the courtyard. And yeah, in the meantime, the bed and breakfast is in full operation already for six years. It's extremely well booked and it's definitely hard to get a, a room under the book long in advance. And in the dresses also designed by the students, the staff looks very professional and there were already many newspaper articles and some television reports on their bed, bed and breakfast. And this really makes them extremely proud, proud of uh, the new job and of the workplace. Yeah, and it was mentioned already before. So in the course of the hands-on exhibition and conference, which took place in Vienna in 2016, we undertook an excursion to open off with some of the participants in a small group of 10 uh, coming from different networks. So you know them all. <laughs> um, so we stayed in the bed and breakfast for two nights to do a post-conference working retreat. And um, it was basically on this table uh, that we came up with the idea to found a network of networks. Yeah, now finally back to Vienna again, to our so far largest design build project, uh, the Nordbahnhalle. It was part of a research and development project, which was undertaken at our university's department of housing. Uh, the project focused on the facilitation of uh, a sustainable mix of different utilization in the urban development area of the former Northern Railway Station. So in the next years, uh, the site of this former railway station will give place to around 5,000 apartments. And yeah, although the research and development project is run by the Department of Housing and Design, it deals uh, preliminary with non-housing functions, which should be implemented, tested, and researched here already before the people move in the housing units. So an old warehouse and office building was temporarily provided to us by the Austrian Federal Railway Company before it later should be torn down. So more than 50,000 square feet of indoor space and a lot more outdoor area in a great location, which we were allowed to use to set up a temporary laboratory for testing new formats of working and for various cultural and leisure activities in this urban development area. So together with the students, we developed a concept for an incubator for experimenting, teaching and researching on site. 
and uh, the space uh, was used for co-working and co-making but also for a wide variety of events and a small gastronomy which we were also running and apart from the this space allocation plan it was also necessary to find a legal and organizational uh, framework for the daily operation of the Nordbahnhalle so we founded a support organization which was separated from the research project uh, the not-for-profit Nordbahnhalle development and operation company which worked as an independent corporate backbone of the Nordbahnhalle but now back to spring 2017, so the hall was far away from plug and play, so there was a lot to fix, repair and clean in the beginning. So most of the windows were broken and nailed up with wooden boards. So the first step was to bring light and air into the former dark halls. So new openings were broken into the walls. and some former openings closed and sliding doors with polycarbonate glazing were built by the students to open up the hall as to the to the sweeping urban wilderness and also the corporate identity for the Nordbahnhalle was designed by the students and built as an oversized logo from old wooden planks and mounted on the facade so landscape from wooden pallets got installed in the courtyard and many of the old high racks, which were remnants of the previous use as a storage hall, were used as building material and configured in a new way. Here, for example, is a storage wall in the maker space, as well as uh, sitting and working furniture in the public co working space. So further high racks were then converted to a vertical retreat, retreat lounge and, and play area. And the canteen was a quite compact uh, supply unit, which like a control center was positioned in the middle of the complex of buildings and also worked as info point for all interested visitors and as concierge for the makers who were frequenting the co-working and co-making facilities. So a team of 10 students who already were involved in the design and building phase of the project uh, could be employed by our company and they were in charge of the organization of the daily business handling requests for renting the event space doing the general housekeeping and caretaking as well as the technical support for the events and uh, it was very important to have these teams who who really were on site nearly day and night yeah, the courtyard was like the entire Nordbahnhalle public space where nobody was forced to consume anything. We also provided a public grill where guests could bring their own food to do barbecue on their own. And besides many public educational events, uh, there was a lot of space uh, available for residents and other interested visitors for appropriation and versatile use. Also very Diverse users, the so-called makers, were accommodated in our Werkhalle, this uh, maker space, which measured some 9,000 square feet. So this community workshop was not only used by the design build students, but we also made a call for interested makers who were invited to apply for 25 positions within the Werkhalle. And so they could store their personal tools and materials in the individual storage rooms behind the wooden wall and uh, the big central space could be used by everybody together on a fair use system. So it was also providing enough room for space filling projects. And yeah, when selecting these 25 makers for the Werkhalle, we tried to arrange an as heterogeneous mix as possible. So from people producing cargo bikes to one guy building modular bikes, a violin maker, uh, ceramic artists, textile artists, and the uh, ambitious plastic recycling association. Even a blacksmith was uh, part of our diverse Werkhallen community. And they all were one person companies who wanted to try out the business idea and didn't want to do this alone, but wanted to attempt new forms of collaboration. So and as you can see here, there was already a first joint project where the blacksmith made a knife blade from these old bicycle chains from the bike people and the precious plastic guys developed the grip 
which they cast from recycling uh, plastic and so they already created the first product together there there was also lots of space for workshops uh, dedicated to knowledge transfer so here for example a DIY skateboard workshop took place and in the course of the years the Norpen Halle also developed into a very lively neighborhood and cultural center the space for flea markets and food markets exhibitions film festivals performances even experimental opera and theater productions which took place and concerts and up to techno events uh, a very special event format which was invented by our student team was the so-called Nordbahnhalle bicycle race so the track ran through our various halls and also open air around the halls and the race quickly gained cult status and took place five times uh, always with a very different racetrack and an extended DJ program and after party and uh, yeah so as you see this really it was a place for very different uh, um, opportunities and the two and a half years uh, that we were running the Noppenhalle showed, showed this broad potential of and the demand for a space like this generally in Vienna but also especially in this rapidly growing urban development area but the future of Noppenhalle always was uncertain so of course the project in the very beginning was just supposed to be a temporary one, an experimental interim use before the complex should be finally torn down and become part of a big landscape park in the future. But already in the early days of the project, uh, the question arose under what conditions parts of the Nordbahnhalle could remain in the long term as a non-profit social cultural center for the neighborhood. So many discussions were held with the city and the railway company and various long-term concepts and scenarios were developed. Uh, some people of the city councils, especially the Department of Art and Culture supported the idea of keeping parts of the Nordbahnhalle alive. But there were also many confirmed pessimists within the city government who, who didn't see the potential, but just saw the problems and insisted on tearing it down completely. So, the city for a long time made no binding statements and the planned demolition date was getting closer and closer. And finally in June 2019, just a few weeks before the scheduled uh, termination date, a public interest group with neighbors, artists, architects, social workers, students and researchers was founded, uh, which then campaigned intensively for the preservation of parts of the Nordbahnhalle. And so a press conference was hosted in the, in the hall and a broad public media campaign took off. Thousands of signatures were collected uh, for the preservation of Nordbahnhalle. Nevertheless, we had to close operations at the scheduled time in summer 2019, but at least the city suspended the demolition plans for the moment and called for a pause for reflection. So with the public interest group, we, were, um, we, we used this, this time for further developing a holistic long-term concept, which should be jointly supported by a broad base of cultural and social initiatives, and it should be financially supported by the city of Vienna. The concept that ensures that this valuable spatial resource could remain a unique uh, neighborhood cultural center in the future. So far so good, but uh, smoke signals uh, over the city then unfortunately announced uh, the final over and out for the neighborhood center. The Noppenhalle was set on fire on the 10th of November 2019 and so badly damaged uh, that the structure could unfortunately no longer be saved. So the total demolition had to take place immediately afterwards as the remaining structure was in great danger of collapsing and only the old historic water tower which was used to fill up steam locomotives uh, we thought in the early days survived. Obviously there were many rumors that uh, Norbenhalle was burnt off warmly removed uh, as we say in Austria but there was no evidence found for that. At least uh, we just were very lucky that this happened at the time when the hall was not in operation and that no one was hurt. Yeah, but what remains is the 
public demand for special adequate replacement uh, for the loss of the Norpen Halle and for an initiative for social cultural non-commercial spaces for the whole of Vienna. And I personally hope that the spirit of the Norpen Halle as a space open for appropriation by neighbors can be found somewhere in the newly erected buildings of the quarter and that the Norpen Halle experiment will leave its mark somewhere there. Yeah, this was a short cross section through some of our projects, uh, quite dense. <laughs> uh, there will be a lot more to, to tell on, on the single projects uh, and on the different processes. Yeah, but I think there's maybe still some time left for questions. Thank you very much.